Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books is pleased to host a conversation with filmmaker Ken Burns discussing his newest book, Our America, a Photographic History. Ken Burns has been making documentary films for over 40 years. His films have been honored with dozens of major awards, including 16 Emmys, two Grammys, and two Oscar nominations. It is my extraordinary pleasure to welcome Ken Burns. Welcome. Thank you, Heather. I'm so great to be with you. Well, thank you so much for being here today. You are considered to be the most influential American documentary filmmaker of our time. And you are here to discuss your latest book, Our America. Tell us about it. So this is a book that I've been thinking about and dreaming about for probably 15 years. Um, I've had to do it in the evenings over the weekends and spare time with my colleagues, Susanna Steisel and Brian Lee and David Blistein. Uh, what I wanted to do was just tell a history of the United States in still black and white photographs, one photograph per page, beginning with the first known selfie taken in 1839, the year photography was invented, and coming up more or less to the present. There are a little bit over 250 images, and the captions underneath these full-page photographs are very, very minimal. It might say, Washington, D.C., 1900. Um, but then in the back matter, there's a thumbnail of each of the photographs reproduced, with a much greater detail about the photographer, if we know who it is, the provenance and backstories that I think make it more interesting. But what I wanted to do, pure and simple, was just to give full value back to the still photograph and its ability to convey complex information. So I'm asking people to sort of sit in a way um, that they don't do in my films, where I control how long you can see a photograph and whether I'm going to zoom in or not. You can do the zooming in. You can look at it for an hour or one minute or skip the page entirely. So I, I'm I'm trying to go back to a sense of the centrality and purity of a still individual image to tell us about the totality of us, um, our America, you know, all the contradictions, all the controversy, all the complexity, all the majesty, all the intimacy of it, the joy, the sorrow, the grief, the wars, the peace, the fun, it's all there. Of the images in the book, how many also appeared in your films? Which, no, it's interesting. We wanted to get all 50 states and we wanted to represent all of our projects, kind of. We didn't want to call attention to it. And I was just counting the other day and of the 250 plus, 75 are most definitely I've used in films before. But I think what's more interesting is, are the, all the other photographs we didn't use that are sometimes about the subjects that we covered. That is to say, in our exploration for this book, perhaps looking at 30,000 photographs to get the, you know, 250 here, um, we discovered other ones and, and, and made interesting discoveries. And of course, many of them have nothing to do with our films and are just about a tour of the United States in all of that complexity. Wow, that's incredible. You've inspired many to love documentary film and history. Who has most influenced you? Well, pretty easy. Three people. My mom, uh, who got cancer when I was a couple of years old and died just before my 12th birthday when I was 11. I think it's her loss that makes me interested in the past, makes me interested, as my late father-in-law, a psychologist said, in waking the dead. My father was a cultural anthropologist, but an amateur uh, photographer who built a dark room in, my very, in our basement of our house in Delaware. And my very first memory is of him building it and then of me being in that eerie darkness as the magic, the alchemy of photographic development took place in the weird light and the smelly chemicals. And I, I just have a very wonderful uh, image of that. And then my mentor, Jerome Liebling, who uh, taught me at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, where I went to school from 1971 to 1975 and stayed close to him uh, until his death. He remained a teacher and a mentor and a, and a dear friend, a father uh, figure uh, until he died in 2011. It is his uh, photograph that graces the cover of the book, which I think is one of the most beautiful photographs I've ever seen in my life. And we came across it uh, in in class and, and looked at it and loved it. And I've sort of carried it with me uh, all along. And when I was thinking about what I'd put on the cover, um, that was pretty close to the to the top and ultimately became the image for the cover of the book. 
Well, let's jump into the book. One of the first images is an architectural photograph of the Capitol. Why was it important to start here? Well, you know, it's it, we, we, we have several, a few photographs before that, but you know, I think we, our sense of ourselves ought to constantly be disrupted. We sort of think of ourselves this way and then we turn around and then we're another way. And when we think about the most recognizable building, I would suggest in the world, it would be the Capitol building. But that was what it looked like uh, for the first several decades of the, of the 19th century. That's what, what we did until there was a huge expansion of a project that was completed in the middle of the Civil War with the Statue of Freedom uh, being lowered. I think it was in 1863 while, while Lincoln was prosecuting the war. So it's uh, it, it was important to understand that we have lots of layers, you know, uh, I think it was John Muir who looked at the Grand Canyon and said it was a it was a grand geological library, all the layers and the strata. And I've been trying to get at the strata all of my professional life in my films and and really in this book at the various strata of American history. And all, as I was saying, it's glory and it's sadness. And, you know, there's lots of playfulness and fun and and just the sheer majesty and beautiful uh, landscape that, that we have enjoyed uh, is represented there, along with, as you'd expect, the wars and the and the struggles and the conflicts. Well, you also include many portraits which form a tapestry of American life. One of the most iconic images included was Abraham Lincoln. Why? Well, this is the last photograph ever taken of him. I think it's the best photograph taken of him because he reveals himself so clearly and openly. He's, he's incredibly transparent and you see him holding his spectacles. You see the way he's dressed. He knows the war is going to end. He doesn't know that he's going to end. He's going to be assassinated in a, in a few short weeks. But in his eyes is contained all the history of where we've been, all that we are at that particular moment in the winter of uh, of uh, 1865. And he also looks like he sees all that's going to happen. And I've always returned to him, his words, as well as his image, as a kind of touchstone of un getting to know the best of us, what he would say and did say in his first inaugural, The Better Angels of Our Nature. So he's a profound influence on me as a filmmaker and as a human being, as a citizen of the United States. And of course, to have arguably the most important photograph of him taken is is really important. Lincoln is included in many ways throughout this book, especially in the narrative text in the back. But can you discuss the importance of this image? Well, yeah, I, here's what I would say. You know, as you can see throughout the book, race is a is a huge sub-theme of my work and certainly of the story of the United States of America. So you could say that the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, written by Thomas Jefferson, who owned hundreds of human beings and didn't say it. Abraham Lincoln wrote the 2.0 version. Declaration is 1.0. 2.0 is the Gettysburg Address. We Look, we really do mean that all men are created equal. And then that last shot, it's up above behind Abraham Lincoln, now a statue immortalized uh, in the hearts of his countrymen, uh, who's the, the dedication says that he saved the union. And what is he listening to? We're listening, we're looking at him listening and he's listening to Dr. King's speech on August 28th, 1963 on the Mall, the famous I Have a Dream speech, which I think for all intents and purposes might be our 3.0, the latest iteration of the best of us, those better angels that Lincoln talked about. So he's throughout the book in lots of ways. There's a picture of the crowd in the soft spring rain in, in Springfield, Illinois, when he's buried just a few pages after the, the first portrait of him. But I think he informs a good deal of the spirit of this country to this day. And any book uh, that's going to attempt, however foolishly, to put its arm around the whole country and embrace it, as, as I've tried to do here in black and white photographs, one to a page, is always grappling with the legacy and the importance and the incredible eloquence of Abraham Lincoln. For sure. Your work also celebrates both diversity and sameness in the American spirit. How does one artfully reconcile 
those two things. There's, it's so, you know, the problem is we are, you know, we live in a media culture where everything's red state or blue state, black or white, young or old, gay or straight, whatever it is. It's all some false binary system and it just doesn't exist. And we live in a computer world in which everything is binary, a one or a zero, but it's not like that. Um, we're all part of the human race. We spend all of our time uh, trying to distinguish ourselves from others when we are more alike than we are. And I think the book sort of celebrates that diversity and at the same time, the humanness of, of us. There's, there's only one race and that's the human race. I've been making films about the US, but I've also been making films about us. That is to say the two letter lowercase plural pronoun. And if I've learned anything in nearly 50 years of doing this, uh, Heather, it's that there's only us, there's no them. So while we can celebrate the diversity of the arc, uh, the spectacular, I think in this case, photographic evidence of the arc of us, uh, the United States, we can also understand that so much of what we aspire to, so much of what we're drawn to, everyone is drawn to as well. And the kinds of distinctions that we make, this othering of people is, is such a dangerous and, and, and very much a fool's errand. And the book is celebrating the totality of us, our America. You know, um, you include a book of the fourth colored US infantry. And I'm, I know we're coming up on the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the military. And I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of, of that image and um, why you included it. Well, it's just so, so important. You know, the, the previous, this is in 1863, the previous September after a kind of stalemate at the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln still feels like he's got the political will to be able to issue the Emancipation Proclamation that'll go in effect on January 1st. It doesn't free a single slave in territory he controls. It's a political document meant to check um, uh, France and England from joining on the side of the South, which are starved for Southern cotton because of Northern blockades of, of Southern ports. And so, but he's also knows that he's ennobling the war. It's, it's, he's moving it not just for a fight for union, but for emancipation, which is making us live out, as Dr. King would say, a hundred years later, the true meaning of our creed. And what begins to happen in the summer of, of 1863 is that free blacks and escaped uh, former enslaved people are beginning to uh, form regiments directed uh, and led by white uh, officers, uh, but, but, but bravely defend the Union and the idea of emancipation. Perhaps as many as 200,000 black soldiers fought for the North in the Civil War, and that's one of the early regiments. And there was a wonderful story that issued from the research that we did on the Civil War series, where an old um, a former enslaved person went back as a member of, of a Union regiment uh, back to his former plantation, just happened to be there and looked at his overseer and said, uh, bottom rail on top now. And uh, it gave the title of a, of a chapter in our fifth episode, The Universal Battle of the Civil War, Bottom Rail on Top. Wow. Another iconic image included was of the dedication of the Statue of Liberty. Can you speak to the inherent contradiction with American freedom? Yeah, no, it's a pretty interesting um, uh, story there. This is late uh, October, 1886. It's a big, huge thing. If you get up real close, you can see that there's a kind of flag covering her face and somebody's supposed to give the signal. And, um, and you know, what happens is, is that somebody does and the president of the United States gets interrupted by, you know, the brass bands and the horns going off and all that stuff. And I want to point out no one said a word about welcoming immigrants at that event. No one. This was a gift from the French, originally intended to be given to Mrs. Lincoln to celebrate the survival of the Union despite her husband's ultimate sacrifice. It took many more years than the planners and the sculptor and the benefactors uh, provided. And so it became a kind of symbol of freedom, as one British newspaper cynically put it, you know, from, a Fran from France that has too little liberally to America, which has too much. Um, but it's not about welcoming immigrants. It's only later, the doors are already wide open from 1870 on, 
1920. And a lot of people are passing through. And of course, there is an already established for many generations, American Jew named uh, Emma Lazarus. They've been around since colonial times, her family, uh, who'd fled the Inquisition and ended up in, in, in New York. And she wrote a poem, um, which is, you know, the famous, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe, breathe free. But, but what happens is that you see that much of American history is a tension between the self-proclaimed idea that we are a melting pot which we are, that we are a nation of immigrants, which we all are, except native peoples. And you could even say that they, crossing the land bridge of Bering Strait from Asia uh, to Alaska, um, all of the Americas are populated by people who migrated here. But let's give them the fact that they're the first inhabitants and therefore not immigrants. Um, we're all immigrants. And yet a good deal of the policy of the United States, a good deal of what animates sometimes the, the real and sometimes uh, manufactured conflicts of our political discourse have to do with who's a real American, who can get let in, who should be let in, who shouldn't be let in, how do we control this, um, all of this stuff. And it's led to some pretty dark chapters in our history, including the embracing of eugenics, which was a false pseudoscience that suggested that there could be a hierarchy of races that had white northern Europe European Protestant people at the top, a hierarchy of ethnicities, a hierarchy of nationalities, and led, you know, when of course, as I said, there's only one race, the human race, but it led to a very pernicious and limiting uh, Immigration Act of 1924 that, that had this quota system that favored those countries from uh, northern Europe and, and were anxious to keep out or have low quotas for those countries uh, that had a lot of Catholic or Jewish uh, population. This question of who to let in is a tricky question when we think about indigenous peoples who lived here. And your, your book showcases our ongoing struggle for freedom as a nation and freedom for all. Can you discuss the Carlisle School image? Yeah, that, well, this is a tough one to talk about. You know, the, it, th this was a place built by reformers, people who thought that they were friends to the Indians. Let's put that in quotes. But, you know, the slogan became, you know, uh, kill the Indian, save the man. The idea was to take these hundreds of various nations, tribes of native people and sort of beat their culture out of them, literally. If you spoke your native language, you were beaten. Your, your hair was cut off. And of course, that was a point of pride uh, for women, but also for men. Uh, you were dressed in Western garb. You were forbidden the rituals and the, and the aspects of, of your daily life. And this was from people who thought they were doing a favor to Native Americans. And of course, the other extreme is we did everything we could to uh, annihilate them. In California, there was even bounty on their heads, but, you know, diseases not intentionally in most cases uh, brought to them. Um, obviously, uh, fights with the United States government over the our infringement of treaties we'd made with them and they had accepted in good faith and uh, a, a very sad history. So I think one of the things that we leave out of American history, even if we're willing to confront aspects of, however superficial, the racial uh, question between the fact that we're proclaiming individual liberty for the world and yet by the time of the Civil War, four million Americans are still owned by other Americans. We forget sometimes to more fully account and reckon with and perhaps begin to atone for the fact of just rampant from the very beginning dispossession of Native peoples from their homelands. This book has extraordinary images throughout. There are images of sporting events. There are gorgeous images landscapes, cityscapes, including national parks. Can you discuss the Mesa Verde image? Oh, I love this image. I'm so glad you brought that up. It, yeah, I've been there. Um, it's one of the most spectacular cliff, cliff dwelling. It's from people that we think came about 500 uh, AD and um, were called ancient Puebloans is the only thing we can come up with. We don't know. They flourish for a long time in the Southwest and their ruins are, are everywhere in Chaco Canyon and uh, in, in, uh, in, 
in Arizona, New Mexico, uh, various places, Canyon de Chez, and this is in southwestern uh, Colorado. It's a spectacular place. You you drive up, you have no idea where you are, and you have to actually climb down into that cliff. You can see how heavily defended it would be as a place to live. It's so beautiful, and it's one of those places where you walk through the rooms and you can kind of feel and understand the presence and then they disappeared. We don't know why, whether it was disease or the conquest from someone else or climate change and the loss of uh, food and uh, water and, and things like that. So it remains a, a to, to anthropologists and ethnologists, a, 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 a still a, a big question mark, but they've, they, their artifacts and their paintings and their symbols are throughout our American Southwest. Your book begins with a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. and ends with a stunning image of Congressman John Lewis. Why? Well, I'm not sure that this is intentional. I begin the introduction to the book. Uh, the, the great photographic curator, Sarah Meister, who now runs Aperture Magazine, the great photography magazine, um, a, you know, has an essay in it, but I believe, begin my introduction with a quote by um, Martin Luther King that talks about how we're all um, bound together, uh, it, you know, in this, we like to think of our, our individuality and our, and we, and we feel particularly these days, a kind of separation, but, you know, he says, um, we are um, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. I love that. And that book is trying to tie us in that single garment of destiny. And then the fact that John Lewis is the last image is by accident. One of the last decisions we made was to put that in. Uh, we had a, I wanted to have an extra page where just as the first page is on the right hand side and doesn't have anything opposite other than a quote by my ancestor, Robert Burns, oh, with some power of the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. And then all the rest are just couplets or just paired together, just two big photographs on a page, minimal captions. And then I wanted there to be a last image that you would turn over, this time would be on the left. And I could think of nothing better than one of my great heroes, a person I ha had the great pleasure to come to know, uh, John Lewis, who has contained so much of the memory of, of the last, you know, many, many decades of the United States history, both good and bad. And, um, it's shortly before his death and he knows that he's dying. And so the, the picture is both vividly alive and also in a kind of repose, almost like death. It has in him the same sort of vision, the distance in his eyes and the understanding of who we are, the pain of it and, and also the hope for it, the aspirations of it uh, that Abraham Lincoln had. And I, I can't think of a better image to end the book on than, than our great, great, great hour great John Lewis. Agreed. Many of the photographs have photo credits to the Library of Congress. Can you speak to the importance of the <laughs> Library of Congress as an American institution? It's just, you know, this is, this is it. You know, Matthew Brady, who was very successful during the Civil War, taking photographs of the various important people and of the dead and his various legions of photographers like Timothy O'Sullivan and Alexander Gardner, who took the picture of Lincoln, you know, were all over the place. But after the Civil War, I think maybe we were less interested in seeing what we had done to one another, which is, you know, murdered 750,000, we now believe, of our fellow citizens in the course of this wrenching, most serious conflict in the whole history of the United States. And so Matthew Brady, when that appetite for photography fell off, as it often did, uh, he went broke and somebody figured out how to work congressional stuff and his photographs were bought by the Congress and had become the sort of the seed of this collection. And I don't know, I mean, there's not a film that I've worked on that I haven't uh, drawn stuff from the Library of Congress. So they, they're always helpful. They have an amazing collection of photographs and films and, of course, um, books, I, you know, the biggest library. And the reading room there is one of the great places, like being standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon to go into the main reading room is to be in one of the great, in this case, man-made uh, places on Earth. And we try to honor them in, in so many ways, at, 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 along with 
the National Archives, which has a great deal of the military record of the United States, all of it, in fact, the government activity. In fact, they don't call the Civil War the Civil War. It was called the War of the Rebellion. Lincoln never once called them Confederates or never once recognized the existence of the Confederate States of America as the War of the Rebellion. And the people that he was, that his loyal American soldiers were fighting were just called rebels. Are there any book images that preview forthcoming documentary films, things we can look forward to? No, not really. Uh, but, um, you know, the same old themes are there. You know, there's so many, as you mentioned, native, pictures of Native Americans. Um, and we're just finishing a film on the history of the American buffalo and the American buffalo and its near extermination is tied in very much with those people who for 600 generations depended on every aspect of the buffalo and used it in a sustainable fashion from the tail to the snort. And, um, you know, part of their near extermination had to do with a calculated policy that while you might be selling hides or you might be picking up the bones or you might be enjoying the tongue as a delicacy um, and slaughtering them in just a frenzy of slaughter for just uh, a few decades in the 19th century, bringing that animal to the beast at uh, the brink of extinction. So too was it part of that calculation that if, if you took away the buffalo, you'd hasten the decline and disappearance of native peoples. And fortunately, both have proved resilient. And where and when will, will people be able to watch? Well, always on PBS. Uh, the American Buffalo will be uh, next October, uh, mid-October. Uh, after that, we're making our first non-American film. In fact, I'm headed off to Florence shortly uh, on the life of Leonardo da Vinci. After that, I spent all day today working on our film on the American Revolution that we hope to have finished in time for the 250th anniversary of Lexington and Concord uh, in 2025. We're doing a film I, it had originally been incubating for decades on reconstruction in which you can see some images in, in the film uh, in the 1870s, late 60s and, and 70s that are reflective of that period. But I backed it up to begin at emancipation and go forward to the beginning of the what's called the Great Migration, six decades exodus of uh, African Americans out of the South, beginning around the end of the second decade of the 20th century. And it, the film is called Emancipation to Exodus. And, and we're working on that. I've, I've done an interview and doing a lot of research and writing. And then fine, and that would be 26, I imagine, if all goes well. And in 27, we've been working for many years already just because we didn't want to miss filming those people that are, were still alive and some are still fortunately still alive um, about LBJ and the Great Society. Our Vietnam film got us very interested in LBJ's uh, domestic ambitions, but we were dealing with a foreign policy catastrophe uh, that took place partly on his watch and uh, we couldn't really delve into it and we wanted to go back and re-examine the second greatest legislative achievement of any president after Franklin Roosevelt and that would be Lyndon Johnson and what he called his Great Society. Well, we have a lot to look forward to. One last question about your book. What do you want the reader to take away from your book? So my mentor, Jerome Liebling's office was filled and home was filled with photography books, hundreds and hundreds of them. And the, and the weight of them, their big coffee table books would kind of sag uh, the, the shelves there. But he would pull a book down and silently hand it to me. And I'd sit in his office in a comfortable chair in the corner and, and read it. Or I'd pick something off or I'd go to the library and I would read or be at his home. And I, what I loved best were those aperture books that just had a single photograph per page and a minimal caption. And I love the ability to retrain the kind of mental mind that we all have and give it over to a work of art. Even, you know, your experience, even in a museum where you're going through a gallery, you spend almost as much time reading the caption as you do taking in the art. And what I wanted to do was see if I could create for the readers of the book uh, the, an intimate time and space for them to receive these photographs. And that's all I want. However long they want to spend with it, whether they go and in a second reading have their, um, you know, their thumb in the back matter so they can learn surprising details about uh, a particular photograph or not. I'll tell you, there's one um, of, of a man slapping a woman. It's a very dramatic shot. It looks like it's maybe made up 
but you then read about what it is and it's even more powerful. So sometimes if you, you know, it's said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes when you attach some words to a photograph, something else happens. So I'm interested in what the photograph can do standing by itself. And then I'm interested in what learning more about the time and the photograph and the photographer, if we know who it is and what was going on, the dynamics of the themes that are engaged or suggested by the photograph, all of that, it would make me incredibly happy. And I, I know that it's happening uh, because my publishers sold out instantly what they thought was a, um, you know, a huge print run and they never thought they'd have to print another book and they're racing to uh, go and print it again. So I'm very happy that people have had that response to the book and I look forward to sharing it with more people. Well, thank you, Ken, for your time, your extraordinary work, and for this gorgeous book, which would, if you can get your hands on it, make the perfect gift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 we sort of feel like the story of us, the story of America, our America is an evergreen topic. So uh, even if, if you miss it for Christmas, I'll sign a book plate and, uh, and you, can, you can have it thereafter. That's the good thing about a book. It, it's unlike the things that break or the things that are exhausted, that it sticks around for an awfully long time. And I, 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 I'm really happy with the response to that. And I, and I really like myself sometimes after a long day working on a film or promoting a film or raising money for the film to just go back and open it myself and discover even new things in the in a photograph I hadn't seen or new emotions and that's part of it too being open to those emotions well, emotions and associations and it is just it is it is stunning and it is challenging and it is everything someone would want out of out of a book so thank you so much and Good night, everyone. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and happy reading. Thank you, Heather.